If you'll turn with me today to Genesis chapter 4, um, we are continuing um, kind of with this account of the beginnings uh, of humankind. Um, we have gone over the last few weeks uh, through the creation of all the universe, including Adam and Eve, um, their temptation in the garden and their fall into sin. And last week we looked at the consequences um, of their sin and also um, God's grace in providing a Savior. And so it's important for us to know two things um, from last week and really from the first three chapters is that God created the world according to a certain design and pattern for man to live according to God's own image. And Adam and Eve were to live in the garden and they were to have dominion over the garden and to work the garden. Um, and uh, when they fell into sin, when they disobeyed God, um, the world was broken, fallen, um, and um, since then, um, we live in a world that now is tainted by, broken by sin. And last week, we looked at, in Genesis chapter 3, some of the ways in which now uh, life in this world is more difficult. Um, in childbearing and in working the earth and producing fruit uh, of the earth. Um, Satan himself in the form of the serpent there is under a curse to crawl on his belly and lick the dust to be in subservience um, to God. But in three, Genesis 3.15 there's this great promise, this first gospel given to us that there were, he will come to crush the head of the serpent. That he is certainly Jesus Christ. And it's where we find our hope is that Genesis 3.15 tells us there will be an ongoing struggle throughout all um, uh, earth until Jesus comes again. There will be the seed or the offspring of the serpent, those who will oppose God, um, will always be at odds, at enmity, it uses that word, with the seed or the offspring of the woman. That is the promised seed that will ultimately lead to Jesus. And so as the people of God, as the church, we still live in that tension between the seed or the offspring of the serpent and the seed of the woman. And we see Satan biting at or, or bruising the heel of God's people all the time. And so that's where we left off last week. And at the end of chapter 3, um, it tells us that Adam and Eve were now banished from the garden. And it says a cherubim and a flaming sword that turned every direction was there to guard the garden on the east side. And so there's this idea that Adam and Eve were banished to the east of the garden. Um, and so today's sermon is entitled East of Eden. And really what we want to look at today is what does life begin to look like immediately outside of the garden? How is sin now going to affect mankind? We've already seen immediately Adam and Eve knew they were naked, they were afraid, they hid from God. There's a certain amount of shame that's really a blessing from God. It's meant to turn our hearts back to God. But under the influence of sin, of sin some people will never return to full fellowship with God and they will go farther and farther to the east, so to speak. So... That's where we'll pick up today in chapter 4. Now you may recognize the title, East of Eden. There was a John Steinbeck novel. I see some smiles on some people's faces. You may recognize that. Um, a novel from 1952 written by Steinbeck. And it actually uh, is based on the idea of Cain and Abel and living in a fallen, broken world. It's not a pleasant read. And the movie that was made with James Dean, this is the poster there in 1955, not long after the book was written, uh, is kind of depressing. Um, and it's because... Um, that the main characters, actually two different generations of main characters in that novel and that movie, they struggle. There's toil, there's backbiting, there's um, revenge, there's despair. Um, there's all kinds of unfaithfulness in human relationships um, in that. Steinbeck wrote this novel um, with the idea, um, uh, based on Cain and Abel, something that said in these scriptures they're going to read today, that he believed that man had one great choice um, is that we can succumb to the passing down of sin or we can choose our own way and do something more noble um, in that. And I think, as we will read this, that Steinbeck was close to what we want to take away from that, but not quite. 
I wish he'd have read Genesis maybe a little more carefully and see where our real hope is. And it's not that we can eventually make the right choice, because we don't and we won't. Um, is what do we do when we realize that we have fallen under the curse of sin? Where do we turn? Now, we've already said we turn to Genesis 3.15. We turn to that one who God has promised will come and crush the head of the serpent. And so, when we consider that we also live east of Eden with sin, with disappointment, with hopelessness, that we are living east of Eden. So, let's go to Genesis chapter 4. Uh, and we're going to work slowly through it. Our time is a little short today. We won't make it through all 26 verses today. Um, but let's begin to trace um, what life looks like outside of God's grand design, his perfect relationship with people once they have sinned, have broken fellowship with God, and now are separated even physically from God's good creation. So let's start uh, at verse 1, Genesis chapter 4. This is God's word for us today. Now Adam knew Eve, his wife, and she conceived and bore Cain, saying, I have gotten a man with the help of the Lord. She's saying, only by God's help have I been provided this child. Verse 2, and again, she bore his brother Abel. Now Abel was a keeper of sheep, and Cain a worker of the ground. And so you see these two sons that she have, one is a rancher and one is a farmer. Um, and here's then what it goes on to tell us. In the course of time, so as they got older, um, Cain brought to the Lord an offering of the fruit of the ground, and Abel also brought the firstborn of his flock and of their fat portions. And the Lord, listen to this, had regard for Abel and his offering, but for Cain and his offering, he had no regard. So Cain was very angry and his face fell. A lot of people are perplexed by this. Um, they both gave of what they had, and it seems that God was not pleased with one, but he was with the other. Now, I think it's a mistake to think that God is more pleased at this point um, with an animal sacrifice than he was with um, a, more of a grain-type offering or the fruits of of the ground. Both of those later will be commanded of people is to give both of those kinds of offering. Cain brings a grain offering or a fruit offering and Abel brings the animal sacrifice, but God looks with favor on Abel's offering. Why? Why is that? Well, I do want you to notice this, that it does say that the Lord had regard for Abel and his offering. And I don't think it means only because of the offering. I think it has more to do with Abel and the way and the manner in which he brings his offering, not what he brings. It is Abel's faith that makes his sacrifice acceptable. Now, you may read this and go, well, that's a pretty big leap to say that. Um, but we have a big clue. In fact, this story of Cain and Abel is mentioned a number of times in the New Testament by Jesus himself and um, even by Paul and in the book of Hebrews. Look at what Hebrews says to us. Hebrews chapter 11, this is that hall of fame or hall of faith where it commends to us the faith of some of these Old Testament characters. And it says this, Hebrews 11 chapter 4, by faith. Abel offered to God a more acceptable sacrifice than Cain, through which he was commended as righteous. God commending him by accepting his gifts. And through his, what? Faith, though he died, he still speaks. And so the writer of Hebrews is saying, there's a testimony all the way from the Old Testament to tell us, here's what matters. It's faith. It's not what we do that makes us right before God. It's that we do what we do by faith and trust. Abel seems to have had faith, and by extension we would say Cain did not. And God, when it says has regard for them, is that it, what makes Cain acceptable is not his acts of righteousness, but his heart of faith towards God. And I think Cain confirms this to us. Um, when we read in his reaction, it says, but for Cain is offering, he had no regard, so Cain was very angry and his face fell. Why is 
he angry? Well, his reaction shows his heart. He's angry, and the problem is not Cain's offering. The problem was Cain, that he had no regard for God. Cain should have been crushed in spirit and contrite in heart. If his offering was not acceptable of God, he should have, in faith, repented and said, what will be acceptable? And I think the answer would have been, I want a worshiper, not a customer. And I want you to know that a lot of us are tempted sometimes and fall into that kind of sin of treating God like a merchant in which we offer something to him so that I get what I want. That is not faith. That's a purchase, not a gift. And God is in the business of grace and mercy and giving gifts. He asks for us to trust only in him. One writer says, the religion of Cain is whatever I give to God ought to be sufficient and acceptable. God should appreciate what I do for him. Now, most of us have good social sense not to say such a thing out loud. Maybe Cain did too. But the problem is God knows the heart. You know, even something as important as gathering here on Sunday morning for worship can be an act of pur purchase and not worship. You see, we can easily fall into that and say, I'm at church every week. I write my check and put it in the offering plate every week. I sing in the choir. I serve in the deacon or the elders. I do this and I do that. Here's my offering, God. It better be good enough. That's not worship of God. It's not acknowledging what God asks of us. Yes, all those things should be part of our lives, but they're not a transactional relationship with God. It's the response of faith when we realize we don't hold up under his perfect standard. What do we do? We seek forgiveness. And by faith, we know where forgiveness comes from. It's by Jesus' own sacrifice. We have the benefit of living on the other side of the cross from Cain and from Abel, but Cain's reaction is anger, and he shows that he's not trusting. He's certainly not repentant when faced with his own sin. But the Lord, as always, does something gracious immediately. You remember Adam and Eve when they sinned? They were hiding in the garden. They, saw, they sowed fig leaves to cover their shame. And instead of doing what a lot of us would do and leaving them to themselves and God saying, hey, you, when you get that sorted out, you come find me, what did we find God doing? He went to them. He called to them. And he said, where are you? God knew where they were. Um, just as in these verses now, here's what God says. The Lord says to Cain, verse 6, why are you angry and why has your face fallen? That's a rhetorical question. God knows the answer to that. But he wants to give Cain an opportunity for repentance. And I hope you know that when we are confronted with our sin, that is an act of God's grace. When we are confronted with that, the appropriate response is to fall before God and say, I have sinned. Have mercy on me, O God. That's what David models for us in Psalm 51 when he's committed murder and adultery. What does he say? I'm a sinner. I've always been. Now, God, have mercy on me and create a new heart and a new spirit in me. But Cain doesn't do that. God says, if you do well... Uh, will you not be accepted? In other words, if you will repent, you will be acceptable. I will have regard for you. In fact, God doesn't even say try again and bring another offering. He just says if you will uh, do well, which I think points to if you will respond the way that you should. But then there's a warning. If you do not do well, sin is crouching at your door. What a vivid picture that is. God says, you're in danger here. You've been in rebellion. You've not had faith in me. And then he uses this uh, thing that should sound familiar. Last week in chapter 3, um, part of the, the curse on the marriage relationship is we said that Eve's desire will be contrary to her husband. It's the same words are used here. Your desire, uh, its desire, talking about sin in Cain's life, will be contrary to you. It will seek to rule over you is really what that means. He says, but you must rule over it. 
That's a much misunderstood, in fact, that last line there, but you must rule over it, plays a big part in Steinbeck's novel, East of Eden. In fact, he has a character that comes to one of the struggling characters in that novel. There's a character named Cal, and he has a notoriously bad mother who's left her, his father and gone back to a life of prostitution and de deceit and thievery and all kinds of things, and he starts feeling that he is cursed and he will never be a good person because he's inherited that from his mother. You hear the themes of Genesis there in that story? He gets a caregiver to him, talk, talks to him about Cain and Abel, and quotes this last line and says there's a Hebrew word um, that talks about this great choice that you have. You just need to make the right choice. Well, here's where I think East of Eden falls a little short, that Steinbeck starts in the right direction, but he doesn't get all the way there. You see, Cain has already failed God. It's not that he needs to make the right decision, it's that he's already made the wrong decision. And like many of us, confronted with that, um, not only does he not repent, but he doubles down on it. Now notice, um, again, what... Um, Cain does here. It says, Cain, uh, so God has said, hey, I want you to repent. I want you to return to me. You can do well. Be careful. Sin is there to get you. And immediately what happens? Cain spoke to Abel, his brother, and when they were in the field, Cain rose up against his brother, Abel, and killed him. You see, what we're seeing here is the seed or the offspring of the serpent um, personified in Cain here, now rises up and is attacking the seed of the woman or the offspring of the woman. Now, if Abel represents this line in which God intends to bring a savior into the world um, that will crush the head of the serpent, it seems like all hope is lost right here. It seems like the serpent wins here. Cain kills Abel. It's also worth noting how quickly Adam's sin now has spread, is that all mankind, including the first generation of children of Adam and Eve, now not only inherit this sin, but one of them, Cain, embraces it and goes headlong into destruction. And suffice it to say, in the New Testament again, in 1 John, John is writing about loving one another, about human relationships, and he says this plainly, referring us back to this story, we should not be like Cain. Now I bet you didn't know, or didn't need to go to 1 John to get out of this story we're just reading, don't be like Cain. I think most people reading that story. But here's what he tells us is, why is Cain doing this? It's because sin has crouched at his door. Sin has overcome him. Now he's living according to his sin, not according to faith. He says, we should not be like Cain, who was of the evil one and murdered his brother. And why did he murder him? Because his own deeds were evil and his brother's were righteous. You see, he's pointing us to the seed of the woman and the seed of the serpent. You see, why do people under the influence of Satan hate, kill, and destroy those who are followers of God? John just simply says because they're followers of God, and that's how the world works. That's the brokenness of sin in this world. Satan's always crouching at the door. Satan's always wanting to consume us. He's always wanting us to be given over into sin. And so we find out that, again, his reaction, then the Lord said to Cain, once again, God comes to him again, now that he's even gone one step further, maybe way more than one step. The Lord says to Cain, where is Abel your brother? Again, God is asking a rhetorical question. God knows what has happened to Abel. And here's the response. I don't know. Am I my brother's keeper? Another famous line from this story. And the Lord said, what have you done? Again, God knows what he's done. And he says, the voice of your brother's blood is crying to me from the ground. It's interesting that sin now has a full grip on Cain's heart. He's resisted God's 
uh, entreaty to him at least a couple of times up to this point. And we may not get it um, in English the way that it was intended uh, originally, but when he says, am I my brother's keeper, that's a real smart aleck response to God. In fact, the Hebrew of that is basically his brother is a shepherd um, who kept animals, and he says, am I the shepherd's shepherd? Um, Cain thinks he's really clever responding to God that way, but he's being insolent, rude, and rebellious in doing that. One person calls this bold face, callous indifference. This is a defiant, insolent, rhetorical question to the Almighty. Who does that? Who in the face of God's demand for righteousness, our awareness of our lack of it, and God saying, respond to me in faith, responds rude and insolently to the Almighty God. Many, many people, including you and I, until Christ changes us. And when God says, your brother's blood is crying to me from the ground, He's saying that sin deserves justice. And maybe here's where we'll leave off today. Does sin deserve justice? You see, God, if he's a holy God, if he's a righteous God, he does not just excuse sin like this. Not just because we look at this and go, what a heinous thing is to murder your own brother out of jealousy. It's because all sin deserves it. You may think, well, at least I've not done something as bad as Cain. Well, what's as bad as Cain is not responding in faith to God. It's not what you've done or what you've not done. It's where you stand before God. And the Bible tells us all of us have sinned. All of us deserve the wages of sin, but uh, that's death. But God's gift is righteousness. So I'll refer us again back to chapter 3. Why is there a he that has to come to crush the head of the serpent? Because again and again and again, we will be like Cain. We will not only do what we should not have done, we will not respond in faith, but sometimes confronted with our own sin, we double down on it and go, I don't owe an explanation to anybody. It's much of the world that we live in today. In Genesis chapter 4, the rest of the scriptures from Genesis all the way to Revelation will tell us there's only one place to turn when we're confronted with our sin, and that is only to Jesus. And so when John Steinbeck says, hey, we have the great choice, there's another passage in Hebrews chapter 12 that tells us that there's a better blood than Abel's. He's referring us back to this idea that the blood of Abel cries out for justice, but there's another blood that's better than that, the blood of Christ. You see, Abel's blood cries out for justice and even vengeance against evildoers, but Jesus' blood cries out for forgiveness, even for murderers. So confronted with our sin today, what is Cain and Abel's story tell us that God's plan is not thwarted. You see, we'll find out next week at the end of this chapter, there is another son given that God has said he will be the ongoing seed of the woman, the offspring that will eventually lead to Jesus. So all the way back in Genesis, when all seems dark and lost, God reminds us of his promises and of his power to make good on those. He will save his people from their sin. Once again, I'll tell you, this is the reverse of the curse. Yes, we live in a broken world, but Jesus' blood does not cry out for our vengeance. It satisfies the wrath of God because he bore it for us. The great choice is, will you repent and believe, or will you remain separated from God? He's calling us to embrace him today. Repent of our sins and trust in Christ. Let's pray. Our Heavenly Father, we thank you that you've given your own Son, Jesus Christ, for sinners like us. We see so much of ourselves in this story. We'd like to believe we're only able, but we have Cain's blood in our blood as well, uh, that we've inherited this streak of sin, this brokenness, this pull towards rebelliousness and obnoxiousness before God.
we are guilty. And so today, as that's laid before us, let us have a clear picture of our Savior in Jesus Christ, who has said, I will exchange my righteousness for your sin, that the grace and the mercy of God could be poured out upon us. Let us respond in faith and obedience today, trusting in Christ and Christ alone. So help us to live a renewed life, giving all of ourselves to you in every part of our lives. We ask this today in Jesus' name. Amen. Let's close with our hymn, hymn number five, How Great is Our God. Let's stand and sing. <laughs>